Hello, everyone. Hello. Um, first, thank you so much for coming out on the stormiest night of the year, I guess officially, right? Um, but I would like to welcome you to the Contemporary Jewish Museum. This is where we make the diversity of the Jewish experience relevant for 21st century audience. We accomplish this through innovative exhibitions and programs that challenge, educate, and inspire. And my name is Gravity Goldberg, and I curate the public programs here. So I have been looking forward to tonight's panel um, ever since I sent out some emails and all of these wonderful people said yes. I couldn't believe our luck here at the museum. <clears throat> However, you might be asking yourself, why would a museum, a place where we do interior art, would we have a panel about public outdoors art? Well, the answer is right across the hallway. Um, our curator, Rennie Pritikin, uh, organized with Ned Kahn to install um, a beautiful disc, moving disc. I hope all of you got a chance to look at it before coming in here. And if you haven't, hopefully you'll have a moment to see it on your way out. Um, and Ned creates a lot of public art throughout San Francisco, throughout the world. Um, if you aren't familiar with him, you are familiar with him if you've ever taken the bar to SFO. And when you ascend or descend the escalator, you will see the sculpture Wind Portal. So I will introduce the moderator tonight, uh, Barbara Goldstein, and she will then introduce the panelists, or they will be introducing themselves, um, and we will, as we go through the evening, um, we'll start with brief presentations so you can kind of come to see everyone's point of view and their interest in public art, and then this will be followed by a moderated discussion and time permitting an audience Q&A. Barbara Goldstein, moderator, is an independent consultant focusing on creative placemaking and public art planning. She is the former public art director for the City of San Jose Office of Cultural Affairs and the editor of Public Art by the Book, a primer published by the Americans for the Arts and the University of Washington Press. Barbara has directed the public art programs in Seattle and Los Angeles, worked as a cultural planner, architectural and art critic, editor, and publisher. She has lectured and participated in workshops on public art in the United States, Japan, China, Taiwan, Korea, Canada, the Netherlands, and Abu Dhabi. So please welcome Barbara. Thank you, Gravity. It's, it's really nice to be here, and it's great to be here with a panel that is so diverse and interesting. Um, Having worked in public art for quite a long time, I have more questions about it than answers, actually. Um, first of all, one of the things that I'm really interested in is actually what makes a work public. I'm not sure that putting art in a public place necessarily makes an artwork public. It might be whether you're creating a work of art that engages the public, and it doesn't necessarily even have to be outdoors. Um, the other question I have is, what's the role of government in commissioning public art? A lot of people think that if you are part of government that you must necessarily be doing things that are really watered down, but my contention is that government has an agenda that has to do with things like fairness and environmental issues and issues that have to do with equality and housing, and, and therefore public art that is created by government can actually be a radical act if we want to promote the kinds of things that government cares about. Another question that I have is, what are the benefits of placing art in public places for a short period of time? Is this an opportunity to actually ask broader questions? And then what are the challenges involved in putting art in a public place? Luckily, we have a panel that has people on it that have dealt with all of those questions. We have the director of the public art program here in San Francisco. We have a working artist. We have an arts advocate and writer. And we have the head of the Foresight Foundation that has work placed in, at the Presidio at, over a number of years that has asked a lot of provocative questions. So we're going to start with Susan Pontius, who directs the public art program in San Francisco, and she'll share with us some of the things that she's worked on. Well, Barbara gave me eight minutes, so I'm 
Got, I'll try to do this quickly. <laughs> um, I'm Susan Pontius. I'm the um, director of both the Civic Art Collection and the Public Art Program for the City and County of San Francisco. Um, those of you uh, may know that the Arts Commission has jurisdiction of over 4,000 art objects, and of the, that have come into the collection through various means, gifts and art festivals, and about seven, over 1,700 works of uh, public art. Um, my background is I actually began as an artist uh, and d did a, uh, a mural in Northampton, Massachusetts, which actually got me very interested in what, how artists could be engaged in a community in a meaningful way. Um, then uh, became director of a small nonprofit uh, organization in Marin County that did uh, both temporary and permanent art in Marin County. And I've been with the city for actually since 1990, um, <laughs> and I'm and, and still alive. Uh, <laughs> so I think I. Um, so I thought I would start in kind of an answer to uh, Barbara's questions and in and and in uh, answer to some of the things that are going on now. I said, what is public art? And I, I use the term public art instead of art in public places. Uh, that's a kind of a um, semantic change that I think happened in our field uh, back in the 80s uh, to more accurately define what it was we thought we were doing uh, when we were commissioning works of art in public in public places. So the first, so there, there's many different approaches, many different ways, but here are the bottom line criteria for me. One, it must be an original work of art created by an artist, underline artist. Uh, not the architect, not a designer, not um, children, um, an artist. Um, the, the term of public art implies the public context in which the art exists and which often determines its meaning. So that not only means that the art is often inspired and created in response to a particular place and that if you move it from that place to another place, it loses its meaning. It can also mean that the, of a work of art that might be perfectly acceptable in one place um, it, it, it uh, acquires a meaning in another place that is totally different. And I've had that experience several times. Um, the other thing, that the main thing to me that makes a work public is that it engages the public directly with the creative work of the artist outside of an art venue. And it engages the artist in their intended audience and the site in the creation of the art. Those are my kind of four or five Four. <laughs> Four descriptions of what I think are the criteria that, it, that public art should meet. Um, so, I like to start with the beginning in San Francisco, which is Coit Tower. And this um, marks the beginning of uh, really public art as we know it uh, in the Depression. Uh, the Coit Tower was one of the works that uh, was um, commissioned uh, by the government to both support artists and to beautify public buildings. And in this project, uh, there was over 27 artists and 19 assistants that were hired to create um, Coit Tower. And Barbara was asking me, why am I passionate about public art? What, what is it that makes me passionate? And honestly, I have to go back to those two simple principles. One is the employing of artists to create wonderful works of art, and the other is to beautify um, public spaces, to make them relevant, to make them more meaningful to the people who use them. And I really see um, my role, and what really excites me in my role is I really look at what it is the government, is the city, in, the, in our case, trying to deliver to its constituents and how, I, and how art can really make that more um, effective. And, I, and, I, and that is what excites me. Um, so when I start a project, I really do think about the overall mission of the facility. What is it it's trying to accomplish? What are the goals that the art program uh, can support? Who is the audience and how will the art engage its community? What are the best opportunities for artists? And how can I, uh, my program, support the artists to do their best work? And finally, our responsibilities for stewardship. You know, can we maintain this work over time? 
So what can art, and I'm quickly, what, what are some of the, the roles that art can play um, in, in the city? Um, one of the obvious ones is the attractions that at attract um, residents and visitors is some place people go to see. Um, cities often are interested in public art because they see these as um, uh, revenue enhancement for uh, cultural tourism, and it, it, it's you know a, a place to go see. Um, more locally, we say we have it celebrates local history. This happens to be in Islayas Creek. This piece by Nobi Nogasawa. Uh, it's a, a half size um, a sculpture representing. A, a, um, I mean, it's a full-size sculpture representing half of a Liberty ship, uh, which has uh, created the cargo industry there in, in Payview. Um, creates unique public neighborhood identities. These are small projects. These aren't the big BAFO projects, but they're the projects that people um, uh, uh, are directly related to, to neighborhoods and identity of place. So these, this is uh, Flights of Fancies by uh, Aline Barr and Colette Kretschner, the Aurelius Walker Drive stairs, uh, a couple of community centers, playgrounds. Um, it uh, represents uh, communities' um, aspirations. This again in the Bayview where uh, the desire was for the, an artwork that was painted on a uh, abandoned grain silo um, and expressed the desire of the Bayview and its aspirations for greater economic um, future. Um, health and, and healing environments are one of the most important places that art has a role. There's actually been a great deal of uh, research showing the benefits of uh, art in healing environments and certain kinds of art. Um, and um, San Francisco uh, has done, in all modesty, probably some of the best projects in the country um, with, uh, this is Laguna Honda Hospital. Um, this was, and, and shown, one of the things here was we were really looking for um, art that um, provided wayfinding, sensory stimulation, um, uh, orientation to time, uh, things that really um, directly served uh, the clinical needs of the population there. And I have to just throw, say one thing was when uh, I first got to San Francisco, I did uh, the mental health facility at General Hospital. And the woman who was the um, director of uh, medicine there, uh, I'm sorry, nursing there, uh, was at Laguna Honda by the time I started that project and had written a white paper describing um, the um, various uh, design features that helped the um, resident population and their clinical um, needs. And I read that paper and I said, oh, but these are things art does. Um, um, art provides wayfinding, it provides uh, sensory stimulation and, and so forth. So I designed my art program around her white paper. When the hospital opened some 10 years later <laughs> and at the opening and I ran into um, this woman uh, again and she was praising the art program and I said, oh, but Mary Louise, it was your white paper that inspired this program. And she said, oh, but it was your program at the mental health facility that inspired that white paper. So that's, um, was pretty exciting to, to know that that really, because she said it really, she could see how it made a difference to the patients and the staff both. And then this is General Hospital, uh, new acute care unit that just opened, uh, lobby, and uh, which is Terrazzo and, and uh, um, Mosaic by uh, Rupert Garcia. There are 15 artists who did projects throughout this um, hospital. And it really is about, um, uh, besides the benefit of the kind of the kind of imagery, the physic, what the chief of medicine said at the opening and, and almost broke down was he felt that the art the quality of the art communicated the quality of the medicine that they and the, and that they provided, um, and it showed respect and care for their patients and their staff. And I know I'm probably running out of time. 
When we do art at SFO, it's a whole different thing. Um, this is our largest, uh, our, our largest collection, our most valuable in, within the city outside of the museums. There's over um, 172 pieces out there. And this is where we are nakedly and unashamedly promoting, well, first SFO and the Bay Area. Uh, we want people, when they get off the plane, um, to say, to realize they're not in Kansas anymore. And um, that, you, that San Francisco and the Bay Area has the most vibrant culture in the country, and our art communicates that. These are some, some of the pieces there. Um, and then it livens the streetscapes. Um, and these are, some, again, these are neighborhood projects. Um, one of by Brian Goggin here um, on the, if I knew how to, this is, oops. Um, Michael Arcega and um, uh, Prima Teva Suarez Wolf. Uh, these are cast. Okay, try this one. These are cast bronze. Uh, chairs at the bus stop at Church of DeBose. Uh, this is Valencia Post. These, uh, the artists create places since we can't post papers on uh, street poles anymore. He created new poles uh, with these Victorian toppings for our neighborhood messages and so forth. And of course, Brian's um, uh, Language of the Birds uh, at Broadway. Some of you probably have seen uh, on Broadway. Or you probably will talk about that. And then, the, and then I think art is also can be very cr uh, crucial and communicate the mission of a facility. And again, it's civic nature. And this is the uh, jury assembly room at the Superior Court by Louis De Soto. And when Louis was uh, selected, he had had the misfortune of serving on a jury just uh, prior. And it was really important to him that this assembly area, which if you've been in most many places, is very um, depressing kind of environment, uh, that he wanted to elevate that to honor people getting ready to serve a very important civic functions. So he brought the, he designed the whole room. It isn't just the glass pieces that, um, it's the whole room, which um, including the Wi-Fi hookups, um, the, the cherry wainscoting, the cherry furniture, um, and what we have here are images of the room where the Constitution was signed. Um, note the round tables in the images are the same here. And here are the, are the signers of the Constitution. Notice that their face is blank. That's so that when you stand in front of it, your own face is reflected back. And this is the opening of the Constitution, uh, which where the letters uh, were blurred because the judges did not want us to be giving instructions to the jury. So it's typically one of the challenges of public art. Uh, Ocean View Library, again, artwork that expresses the, the mission of the library. And confined populations. These are, these are places that nobody else is, besides government is going to really be doing art. So um, Julio Morales and, and Johanna Potig um, brightening up these um, st uh, staff stations or guard stations. Uh, this is a po an etched poem that they worked with the kids to write. Um, and then these um, images in the overhead lights um, that Julio did. And of course, Ned Kahn, um, this is San Bruno Jail. And um, he, this is a locked facility, obviously, and, um, but it has a fabulous gardening program, or used to, and he designed this, um, artist designed a greenhouse to support uh, the gardening uh, uh, activity at San Bruno Jail. Memorials, of course, this is a, um, a, a typical f a function of, of public art uh, for a long time. This is Memorial uh, Court uh, across from City Hall. Um, and this is one we just finished at the um, Public Safety Building uh, for fallen police officers, which includes um, this 10-foot cylinder of glass suspended from a, a skylight. Um, and 
etched poem that the artist and a poet wrote in conjunction with um, the uh, families of fallen police officers. And then finally, as a catalyst of, um, of, of greater activity within the community. So um, some initial temporary installations that we did in Patricia Briggs Green, I think over almost 20 years ago, uh, inspired the local business community to continue to raise money uh, to do a, uh, changing uh, installations in, in sort of the central open space area. And now, um, because it's become so popular, this, the um, uh, Board of Supervisors has annually allocated more money uh, to us to be able to uh, commission um, uh, additional works for Patricia Green. Brian Goggins is going to be our next speaker, and you may not recognize him, but you're definitely going to be recognizing his work. Thank you, Barbara. And it's great to be here um, among all of you. And Susan, thanks for that presentation. There, uh, now I have to go out and see some of those um, public art pieces that I've missed. I thought that um, I would go through a few of the installations that I've been working on in San Francisco over the last, uh, I don't know, 20 years. Um, and the first piece was uh, made possible in large part because of Rennie Pritikin. So I'm glad I'm here with him again tonight. He invited me to be part of a project called Next to Nothing that was a show at the Center for the Arts at Yerba Buena Gardens. And we, um, we looked at the museum uh, to see where a interesting place might be t for me to create an installation. And one of the areas that wasn't being used very much was the sculpture court. And so uh, I uh, designed this piece called Herd Morality, which uses the uh, physical space of the museum and the courtyard as an integral part of the sculpture itself and the installation. So it's as if, for me, the um, the tables have taken on this life of their own. They're roaming across the urban landscape, and you get to uh, catch them in this moment. And uh, it's as if you're in this freeze frame as this um, herd is running right at you in the sculpture court. So part of the um, the reason that I was drawn to creating art in public places and public art was I was initially making films and I'd made about 48 films when I was a kid and um, I, because of an accident, um, lost all of my films and all of my camera equipment and instead of starting over as a filmmaker, I decided that I was going to start focusing on um, painting instead. So I went to art school and I studied painting, but I was having so much more fun building my stretcher bars. I transitioned into sculpture and, uh, and exploring space and uh, my environment with the community and also uh, found objects as I create these installations. This piece, Defenestration, which was up for 17 years on 6th and Howard Streets, made use of a 1908 building that um, had been vacant for many years. Uh, there had been people living in the building, squatting in it, and the, the landlords had just boarded it up, and it was considered a, uh, a kind of part of urban blight. But I found the the building was enchanting. It had qualities that drew me in, and um, I approached the landlords when I was given an opportunity to have a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts. One of the last um, years that the National Endowment for the Arts was providing grants to individual artists, and it was enough money to be able to go out into the community 
and ask for some additional support. I was able to get support in terms of volunteers, about 75 friends of mine, members of the Cacophony Society in large part, but a broad group of people in the Bay Area came together to help me build this piece, but then also a lot of businesses donated um, materials, materials for me to be able to manifest it. Um, we tried to uh, use the whole building, but working with it, uh, composing the piece much like a uh, painter might compose an artwork on a canvas. Uh, a, a permanent piece that was sponsored by the San Francisco Arts Commission is called Substrata, and I made this in 1999. And I went around the Mission District making molds from uh, original portal covers in the sidewalk so that I could uh, connect with the age of these different shaped objects that we often might ignore as we're walking across the sidewalk. But I found them beautiful, much like one might appreciate coins or stamps in a collection. And so in order to refocus people's mind on these um, little wonders, I, I cast their frames and then worked to recreate the, the patterns on these portal covers so that the textured patterns related to stories and legends and history that I picked up on that related to the environment where I'd be installing these pieces. These pieces were all installed on Mission Street between um, Cortland and uh, Presida. And if you walk up there, if you go to every bus stop between those two streets, um, it's maybe a five block area, you can find one of these portal cover art pieces hidden somewhere. So I liked this kind of scavenger hunt um, interaction with the space. And uh, this is an example of one of the pieces that draws from a story I found interesting. There used to be a boardwalk that led from downtown San Francisco all the way up into the mission and the boardwalk was there because it was a, a marshy area. There was uh, a lot of mud and so people wanted to avoid getting sullied every time they came home. So they built this beautiful boardwalk. Uh, the boardwalk has long since disappeared, but before I, um, uh, before the last remnants of this boardwalk were completely destroyed. I was able to get a mold off of one of the old pieces of wood and cast it into this portal cover. And um, so now it's, it's there for as long as that sidewalk is maintained. Um, this piece, Language of the Birds, on the corner of Columbus and Broadway, uh, came about uh, in part solving a puzzle where I was asked to um, work with the community. I worked with the locals in a number of meetings to come up with um, various different ways of approaching creating a public art design that would um, consider various different um, aspects of what was important to them in creating a public art piece. And so one of the things that struck me was that uh, the Chinese community was very interested in maintaining the integrity of Grant Street, one of the oldest streets in San Francisco. They didn't want it truncated um, by a, uh, a prominent, solid sculpture that would um, intrude on the feng shui of the environment. And then um, they, at the same time, asked for something that would be bold and stand out. So it seemed like a interesting contrast to work with. And then um, writers showed up and they wanted me to reference writers from the area and they had their favorites. Um, and it's such an interesting nexus of 
old Italian communities and Chinese communities. It's also next to um, City Lights Bookstore, where, of course, there were loads of beat poets. And so, uh, and many writers have been spending time in San Francisco. So it gave us a chance to really delve into the literature of the, um, the space and compose an artwork that was also inspired by the urban wildlife uh, that make their way through the gullies of the buildings and the cities. Um, I also was um, interested, and I, I should say, I worked on this project with my collaborator, Dorka Keen, and she and I worked together on researching um, all the components for this piece. And she was able to get permission from the Museum of Modern Art for us to bring uh, leaf uh, sized pieces of paper with uh, various different bits of text, words from the, uh, the books that had been written by local authors or written by authors who spent time in San Francisco. And so we threw these words out onto the floor of the museum onto a paper pattern, taped them all down, and then turned that into a pattern that we etched into the sidewalk permanently um, keeping the irregularities of all the ink of all of these uh, different texts, creating a kind of cut-up poem that people can assemble as they are standing between the form of the book and the text. So the consciousness of the person reading a book is, um, is manifested in a new way in this art piece. And uh, there's an image of it, and then there are um, light patterns that move through these sculptures that are also insinuated by birds in flight. Um, this other piece, uh, and my room still rocks like a boat on the sea, Caruso's dream, that I built with a large team that um, was managed and run uh, with Dorka Keen and my good friend Simon Cheffins, who's in the audience here. And uh, this piece was a good example of where uh, public art is, uh, for me, uh, it, it grows out of a community. And San Francisco and the Bay Area has um, enabled me to have access to a very rich palette of knowledge and skill. And so we came together to create uh, a very complicated project that reminded me of the process that I witnessed Werner Herzog going through as he created uh, Fitzcarraldo that was documented so well by my friend's father, Les Blank. Um, and uh, did I skip over? Oh, yeah. So. Um, so when you, if you have a chance to go see this sculpture, bring a radio. If you tune into 90.9 uh, 90 FM, you can hear the sound of Enrico Caruso uh, singing. These were recordings that he did between 1904 and 1921. And I thought it was interesting since he was the first singer to ever record his voice on a phonograph record, and he was also the first singer to ever uh, broadcast his voice on the radio, to have him as a subject, in addition to the stories that are related that, are, uh, that I can go into later, because I know we're short on time, but um, he, uh, for me, really brought together this idea of the artist working with technology in an innovative manner. And since this space is changing, going from a, an, an industrial neighborhood to a um, one that they're associating with media, calling it the Media Gulch, um, I thought this was an interesting way to approach it. Um, and then we brought together performers to create a a, uh, a public art performance that interacted with the sculpture where we brought uh, 12 pianos to play in front of the sculpture as part of this big performance and aerialists coming down 
the building to unveil the project while the extraction marching band um, joined in at the end to kind of christen it. Um, let's see, the, we completed it about two years ago. So um, that's it for my presentation. Um, Cheryl Haynes is not only the um, director and owner of one of the most important galleries in San Francisco, she's also the executive director of the Foresight Foundation, which has been placing really interesting work, provocative work, in the Presidio with, with the assistance of the National Park Service. So she'll tell us about that. Good evening. Uh, I'll try to be as brief as possible. I think we're running a, a bit behind here. Um, so one of the questions people often ask me is, well, you've had a gallery here in this community for 30 years. Why did you go and change it all up about 10 years ago and do this other thing? Um, I established the Foresight Foundation in 2003 primarily because I just felt like I wasn't providing enough public benefit. Um, I, I, I love my artists very much. I work very hard on their behalf. Um, I've been working with some of the same artists for more than 20 years. But I just felt that there was more that could be done, something outside the walls of a gallery or a museum, and engaging the public in a new way. So I began to think about what some of those things could be. And um, basically, what first we first had an artist in residency program that was located in Nevada City, still is located in Nevada City, California, and we would invite artists to come and do a residency, and they'd receive a stipend and then a partnership with a local museum, and it was quite engaging and exciting. We had major artists that that came, and and you know, Pay White and. Richard Long and Cornelia Parker and Mark Dion and others, but it still wasn't providing enough of the benefit to the community. So I began looking around San Francisco and thinking about where are the opportunities? What This is a wonderful uh, environment. It has a deep social and natural history, and I've, I've been always very interested in, in the history of this region. So I ha happened to have a friend who worked at the Presidio Trust and said, well, why don't you come over and take a look at what's going on here? I mean, it was one of the first sites in San Francisco where Westerners um, came and settled. Um, it was a Spanish fort. It was an American military base. Um, there's, there's incredible history with the uh, Ohlone Native American community. So basically what I did was I took about six months and walked every inch of the park and said, oh my, yes, I can see what you're saying. This is pretty fantastic. And, but we, we really wanted to start slowly and we wanted to start with artists that um, could communicate well with the public. And the first artist we decided to work with there was Andy Goldsworthy. And one of the things that's important to know about Andy is that any of the works that he does um, of any kind, public or private, he does not take down a tree. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't create an opportunity for a sculpture. He responds to a place. And there's a huge forestation program that's going on in the Presidio. Um, the, the American military, when they first arrived, planted the entire historic forest. It's all dying at this moment. So they're having to remove most of the trees. So instead of sending the trees to Asia, to make wood pulp out of them and paper, um, we decided to, we started setting aside certain aspects of the forest in which he could make these pieces. Currently, there are four works uh, that reside in the Presidio now, um, and the Presidio Trust has been a wonderful partner in this regard and has docents and maps and, and ways to show you how to find the various pieces. So, but during this process, we decided that I mean, it's great that these works will be here for a period of time. We're not really doing anything to restore them, so they do have a limited life cycle. One of the things about working in a national park is that you cannot do anything that is permanent. Um, of course, the spire has about a 90-year expected lifespan, so, you know, small p, upper p, I don't know. But it's definitely not been um, agreed to be there for a very long time. So we decided to think about how can we activate some of the other spaces in the park. And what's central to Foresight's mission, I suppose I should have started there, is that we're very interested and dedicated to both the 
creation, understanding, and presentation of art about place, whether that is um, natural history, social history, whether it includes you know, current history, which some of our most recent projects do, if you've, you've seen any of them. So this was Presidio Habitats, and it occurred in um, 2010. It was in a place called uh, Fort Scott, which is a not very well visited corner of the park, and in part because the Presidio Trust and the National Park Service really wanted to bring a greater understanding and visitorship to this area. And you know, our our mission is also to collaborate with other entities. And currently, uh, to date, we have partnered with the National Park Service very, very uh, effectively. I think and. You know, I know we're going to talk about the role of government in, in producing public art, but I, I do have to pitch the National Park Service very strongly and say I can't believe the lengths that they have gone to and the trust that they have shown us in doing, in, in some cases, incredibly controversial works on national park soil. They're creative partners, they're generous, they're really, I have enormous respect, and I think the national parks are really one of the major crown, jewels in the crown of this country. So if you haven't been to a national park recently, please go. Okay, this was a, this was a fascinating project in 2012. Um, it's called International Orange, and we were asked by, in this case, that the Parks Conservancy and the NPS to pr propose an exhibition for the 75th anniversary of the Golden Gate Bridge. So we chose Fort Point, uh, a location, I did a lot of polling, and most of my friends had never been there. They didn't realize that it was the only Civil War fort on the West Coast, that it is an incredible uh, cultural um, resource for the Bay Area. And that when the bridge was designed and built, it was designed to leap over this fort and to keep it intact. And you know how architects can be. You know, it's like, get it out of the way so I can do my thing. And I just love the fact that it was kept. Um, it was, a, it was a very large exhibition. There were 14 artists, many of them from the, from the Bay Area, um, but addressing various aspects of the cultural history of the building of the bridge and how the Bay Area changed as a result of it. So this was the first time that we actually partnered with the Parks Conservancy and the National Park Service, and I, I think we must have um, shown them that we were trustworthy because they did, in fact, end up handing over the keys to Alcatraz. <laughs> How many of you saw, did any of you see at large? Oh, thank you very much. Um, just briefly, you've probably, it's been flogged and flogged and talked about in a million ways, um, but I have to say it is, it is, until my current project, it was, the, the, the exhibition that I learned the most uh, by, um, I went to visit Weiwei in China seven times when we were realiz realizing the project. He never saw the project. As a matter of fact, he still hasn't been to Alcatraz. We negotiated a very complex situation with the State Department and the parks and the New York Times and anyway, that's for the book. <laughs> um, but how exciting to be able to work with an artist who's so outspoken and brave and, and was speaking up for not only his beliefs and his issues about human rights and freedom of expression, but speaking for so many other people that couldn't. Um, we had almost a million people see the exhibition. Um, there, be there are two books that are being produced, one of which has already come out, and there's a film that I'm currently working on um, with the artist around the postcard piece and the importance of reaching out and how public art can activate ideas and can change people, that can give them something to believe in. Um, I, I learned so much by doing this project alone. I'm working with Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch. Um, I think it's really changed my practice as a curator forever. And our current project, which is actually closing Sunday, and probably just in the nick of time because it's getting very wet out there. Homeland Security, just very briefly. Um, people have asked why, why, why this title, why this place, why these artists, and it, it's, it's quite simple, really. There were two flashpoints for me. One of them I was meeting with Weiwei after the close of At Large, and uh, I said, well, what are you thinking about now? What's important to you around human rights? And he said, I'm very concerned about the refugee crisis and I'm working on a major film and these things need to be brought forward. 
The second flashpoint was I was in Iran last February visiting an artist, and upon my return, everyone kept saying to me, weren't you afraid? Didn't you feel surveilled? Wasn't it weird? That, I mean, you know, and it made me realize that there's such a misunderstanding culturally between people that it's really our nations that are creating these circumstances, not its people. So when I returned, I thought, how can I, as a curator, keep my sense of social responsibility here? And last February, I came up with the notion of this project, which is essentially asking questions, not posing answers. What is home? What is safety? What do we deem security? The walls and barriers that we build between ourselves as people and as nations and how cultural misunderstanding, ethnic profiling, forced migration, and many other things are happening as a result of it. There are 18 artists from 12 countries, including Syria, Iran, Poland, South Africa, Mexico, Korea, Japan, Vietnam, and the US. This is Doho Sai, he's from Korea. And Activating all of these buildings for the first time was also really thrilling. We brought power there, internet. We have a whole, we have um, 45 art guides out there that we're supporting. Um, we have a virtual reality tour that we created. So we're trying to interact with the public in as many different levels as we can because the site is challenging for, for a, from a handicap accessibility point of view. We've had homeless um, teenager groups out there. We've had veterans groups. Um, we've had over 500 uh, children through school groups. And all of this, um, we raise the funds for just the U.S. government does not support these projects other than psychically and emotionally. And we're really grateful for that support. Thank you. Our last speaker is Matt Gonzalez, who's been a public servant, a civic activist, an arts activist, an arts writer, and an artist. He's going to give us his perspective. Thank you. Um, I thought I might just start out by talking about uh, a couple of things that happened uh, in San Francisco since I've been paying attention that have kind of uh, dramatically changed how the how government and the public looks and thinks about public art. Um, I would say uh, the Burning Man uh, Festival. And I think that uh, graffiti art moving into galleries has had a tremendous impact on why we see so much on the, essentially the, the city canopy, the city walls. The biggest reason is that these particular ideas and movements challenged the notion that there's permanence in art. Uh, you know, when you go out to a festival in the desert and uh, destroy things that you spent hundreds of hours making, uh, it changes your relationship to what should an audience get from your work and how you document it and how it continues to live whether or not it exists as a physical object. You know, when I, um, I had a, a studio behind Guerrero Gallery in its own old location around uh, 19th and York, I was making woodwork at the time, and I would see these exhibitions where these artists would show paintings um, that they were selling, but when you walked into the space, they um, had committed, you know, on the low end, I would say 100 hours to try to paint the walls, create sculpture in the space, and just give you this impact, this environmental thing happened to you when you walked in. And it was just amazing to me that, you know, no big deal. It was almost like there's a little bit of bravado and uh, machismo aspect to it, this idea that, yeah, I can do this and I don't need to worry about it because I can always paint it again and I'm not going to sit around and sweat it. In the late 90s, I don't know if um, folks remember this, but there was uh, uh, a lot written in the Chronicle and there was a mural over around 17th and Harrison, the Chewy Camposano mural, 
that was on, it's a building, it's not quite a triangle building, but it has traffic kind of running around it. And that mural had been up over a decade, probably close to 15 years. And there was so much public upset over the notion that the new owner of the building painted over it. They wanted to do something else with the space. And I think that, that idea wouldn't happen today because the very reason we're able to get art in public spaces is because people aren't scared by the fact that, oh my God, we've agreed to let this thing be here forever. Uh, there were images shown earlier of uh, Patricia Green's uh, area there in Hayes Valley, and I remember when the early Burning Man sculpture got put up there, uh, there were a lot of neighbors who didn't like it. You know, within a couple of months, they didn't want to lose it, and they were upset that it was only going to be there a year or a year and a half or however long it was. They, it was after an extension because the very neighbors that had opposed it suddenly wanted it. Um, you know, I served a, a term on the Board of Supervisors, so I've been in a lot of neighborhood meetings with a lot of angry people um, and trying to navigate that. I taught a, a class at the uh, San Francisco Art Institute, uh, and one of my favorite parts of it was there was a course requirement that every student had to come up with a public art proposal, and I'll share one of them with you. Um, and I'm an, an attorney, so I've looked at contracts. I do primarily criminal defense work, but I've looked at contracts for public art proposals and things like that. Um, uh, but, but let's look at a few pieces of art, and I'll just share with you uh, some of my thoughts. I mean, this is, um, let me see here. This is the bronze chairs at Church in Debose. And um, the artist here is uh, Primitivo Suarez Wolf. And I just, I love the idea of these chairs, I think this is a rainy scene here, but just this, this idea that um, this hard concrete area can be softened by these chairs. And even though they're metal, right, they're completely inviting. You don't even have to sit in them to feel kind of more at ease and comfortable in the space. And um, uh, I, I, I think that they're successful for that reason. They don't try to be something that they're not. It's so simple that um, it's poignant. Um, this is, of course, uh, Clarion Alley, and uh, there were some images shown of it earlier. I think Clarion Alley has uh, celebrated over 20 years uh, in existence. I used to live one alley over on Sycamore Street, and I can tell you that I saw people shoot up in this alley. Um, I've seen punk shows in this alley. A lot happened in this space. Um, and I've seen speeches given, political talks, all kinds of stuff. But the beauty of taking these um, basically garage doors or, or panels and trying to do something artistic with them is uh, a great example of a, a community, you know, taking over a space and making it uh, more livable. Does anybody know whose piece this is? This is Crystal. Via Lula's piece from 2013. Uh, this is an old Barry McGee piece from 1994. We've seen a lot of murals um, uh, in uh, the Tenderloin area. This is a uh, Claire Rojas piece that is uh, relatively recent. Um, and I'll give you a, a shot of it through a different spot here. You can see it through the trees. And this is kind of what it looks like. This is a work on paper that it seems to be based on. But I love this idea that um, the Tenderloin, which is a neighborhood that has the most children living in it in all of San Francisco, uh, can have what Andrew Schultz, who is a great muralist now living in, um, in Los Angeles, says, you know, it, it, there's an egalitarian and democratic thing that happens when you don't have to go to a gallery to see art. You don't have to buy art. And I love the notion that some kid is walking along, and what does it say to them when they get to see stuff like this? This is Jenny Sheriff's work at the lower portion, but you can see Claire's piece up through the trees. And just this idea, this inviting idea that you're allowed to do stuff like that. This, it doesn't seem so uh, such an adult thing to do. It's, it's, it's almost like so playful that I think it can capture uh, a child's imagination. Um, I also like when there are 
these kind of simple images. Here, here you have a bird, and I don't mean to disparage it by calling it simple. Michael Horde's piece over in Jackson Square area. But again, I love this idea of taking a, 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 an animal, a, a bird, a, this part of nature, and it's an instant reminder that you're walking along this very alienated space with concrete and asphalt and glass, and it's inviting you to, to be reminded of you know, your connection to the environment. And here's even another bird, um, uh, Leon Laucher did um, at uh, Argoni Elementary School in the, uh, I believe in the Richmond. Again, it's uh, a kind of image that has a simplicity to it, but, but it has an immediate purpose. Um, one of the uh, pieces I've both most disliked in my lifetime and loved in my lifetime is this. This is by Peter Volkus. Uh, it was um, placed at the Hall of Justice in 1971. And I love Volkus' ceramic pieces. I think they're just fantastic. This piece of metal I never really got, and it always kind of bothered me. I didn't think it should be there. Uh, when I was on the Board of Supervisors, my friend Charlie Campbell, um, who was a gallerist in North Beach for many years, proposed moving it to the Embarcadero. He collected uh, letters from Wayne Tebow and William Theophilus Brown and Paul Warner, all the artists he knew, urging the Arts Commission to, to move it. Um, but I now love the piece. And um, there's something about familiarity that you come to uh, uh, expect to see there. But the longer I've been practicing law and, uh, you know, just realizing both how hard and soft the practice of law can be, how uh, procedure in law takes these twists and turns, how unscientific it is, um, somehow this sculpture has slowly seemed more and more appropriate to me. Um, there's another image of it, I think. Yeah, here's the model for it. Um, and uh, here's uh, Volkus working in the studio. Um, I understand that Volkus put a small ceramic dog into one of the metal uh, components of that sculpture as an inside joke, although now it's trapped there, so I don't know. Um, I'll just stand by uh, sharing uh, one of the student uh, proposals for public art that I, that I thought was fascinating. She proposed that, you know, um, every public trash can should make nature noises. So like when you walk up to a trash can, you should be able to hear running water or birds, you know, singing and or whatever. And I, I just thought that what, what a brilliant idea, the idea to constantly be reminded that the things you are throwing away that are waste and trash are having an impact on the environment. Anyway, thank you and I look forward to our conversation. Thank you all. Um, San Francisco has produced some of the most beautiful well-crafted and site-integrated artworks in, its, in the city's public art program. And I wonder, given the current um, situation with housing in the Bay Area, how important is it to have local artists develop work? I'll, go ahead, Brian. Well, it seems if we don't have an art, artistic community that can thrive in a space, we lose a vital connection to the space itself. And uh, much of the inspiration for public art will be lost. Um, the, the pool of people that could not only inform uh, how to approach a site will be reduced, but also uh, volunteer bases. Um, it's like uh, trying to weave a tapestry without any fabric uh, components, without any yarn. And uh, it just seems like we could create uh, a beautiful uh, collection of public art uh, that is all imported and curated and, um, and it may impress, but will it actually help further the culture of our intrinsic space. Right. 
Susan, do you have any comment on that? Well, as, <laughs> you know, art is an ecosystem and it has many parts, all of which, like any ecosystem, supports one another. And if you lose part of that ecosystem, part of that uh, uh, whole system, of course, the, uh, and artists are one of those, it, the, whole, the whole system is, is, is damaged. And it's really, I think, one of the reasons San Francisco has such a vital uh, public art environment, which coming from uh, all different sources, of people doing all sorts of approaches, just some, some of which you saw tonight, um, is because we have uh, a local art community that has created its own regional dialogue. We export artists in terms of their ideas that influence um, public art programs and art nationally. Um, and uh, we, of course, also have bring, and other artists are attracted to come here because they want to have their art seen in the same, in the dialogue with um, our art scene. So when you lose artists, um, they also aren't informing the institutions that sponsor these, um, these programs. And that means not only just uh, because they're not talking to the people, well, they're not serving on boards. They're not serving on commissions. Uh, they're not in. They're not sitting at uh, convenings like this, um, which is really important in terms of keeping that um, enterprise um, uh, fresh and vibrant. Yeah. Anybody else have a comment on that? No. Um, I had an interesting experience when I was running the public art program in Seattle. I inherited a piece that was by a pretty well-known artist, Bob Irwin, that had been created that was called Nine Spaces, Nine Trees, and it was a very um, site-determined uh, piece. And it was in front of a, a public safety building. People tended to call it Nine Trees in Jail because it was... Um, it was fencing that was around nine different trees that changed colors over the course of the year. And when the public safety building was um, meant, slated to be torn down, I phoned up Bob and I said, you know, this is site determined peace. What do you want to do with it? I'm assuming that you want it to go away. And he said, no, I've actually reconsidered my approach towards site determined pieces and we spent quite a bit of time looking for another location for the piece and it was eventually placed someplace else. So my question to the panel is um, how important is site to public art and what is your feeling about recontextualizing artworks that were determined by a specific site? Any thoughts on that? Well, I might speak to that um, because my practice does really focus on place-based work primarily. Um, you know, it's something that we typically have a very in-depth conversation with the artist about before continuing to, to consider doing something together. Um, obviously, a temporal work is one thing, but I mean, there, there is the flip side to that question. Like if something is commissioned for a particular location in a temporal manner and it is taken down, what is its future? You know, does it still exist? Is it something that can be reconfigured? I mean, every artist has a very different take about it. Um, but I think what's also interesting is when something's created for a site specifically, the dialogue around that shifts, whether it's a physical manifestation or a cultural one. You know, as the cities change and morph and different populations sort of move and come and go, and you know, the context is, is very fluid. And I think it's one of the most exciting things about working with artists that are site-based, is you, you have to, you know, it's like this intellectual game together about thinking about what could the future of this piece be. Yeah, two thoughts come to mind. Uh, I remember a discussion in that class I taught at the Art Institute with the students. We were talking about, you know, public art installations and there's the, uh, the story of the um, Richard Serra piece somewhere on the East Coast that was moved. It was, yeah, it was, a, I think, a federal building, and uh, a lot of the employees didn't like it uh, because it, I don't know if there was a gust of wind or something, or something was happening in the, in the plaza area, or at least that was said. Um, and of course, in that case, the artist didn't support its being moved. But it was very interesting that when it was posed to the students differently, they felt very differently about it. When 
when it was posed to them from a point of view that the, that the architect, the artist that had designed the plaza had not intended for this piece of sculpture to be there, they didn't give greater importance all of a sudden to Sarah. Suddenly they kind of rethought it and they were much more open to it shifting and moving around. Um, the other thought that comes to mind is that big fountain over in uh, UN Plaza. Uh, there have been various times people upset with it. They don't like its design and how it looks or its placement. But then you learn that its placement there was before some of the buildings that have kind of encroached on its space so that you can't really work around it. And I don't have answers, but I think they're just really intriguing uh, challenges. You know? Right. Any other thoughts on that? Well, it's, you know, it's, it's, it does come about that sometimes pieces that were intended to be permanent uh, because the site changed. I mean, you know, cities are changing organisms. They grow and change. And it would be very difficult to guarantee any artist, in fact, we don't guarantee any artist that they can have that this piece of art is going to exist forever in this spot. We could, could not promise that. So, um, and there have been uh, uh, situations where the changing needs of the community, the changing needs of a facility mean that an artwork that cannot be relocated um, has to be destroyed, and which is very painful. Um, and so one of the reasons that we have very, um, uh, we have deaccessioning policies, which is part of responsible stewardship of how you kind of go through that process in a systematic way um, to try to make, I mean, as a, as a, as a, a, a responsible decision um, about what to do with a particular um, work. And having gone through that process a couple of times now, I, I believe the commission made the right decision, um, but I know we made it, and, and there are certainly others that might disagree, but I know that the commission acted um, ethically and seriously, and um, I sort of can sleep at night with the, with the results. I haven't thought about this as well. Uh, there's a mural that uh, Rigo uh, who was Rigo 94, now he's Rigo 23. He made a, uh, a mural called One Tree. Have many of you seen that? It was, um, it was on in the slideshow. And uh, it was a loved uh, mural and the One Tree mural was pointing at an actual tree and it had a, a, a bold, blue background and uh, developers came and reworked the building recently, removed the portion of the sign uh, that was integrated into this entire composition of the mural uh, and removed the blue background, reinstalled the sign behind the tree and in my opinion, really damaged the artwork. I don't know how involved the artist Rigo was in the removal and reinstallation of the piece. I would suspect he wasn't consulted at all. And so to me, it really speaks to this idea that when you remove an artwork from a site, if you're going to continue to uh, work with that artwork, it would be best to try to respect the artist's wishes um, as best you can. And if they're still around, involve them in the process because the answers that you get to the question, what if, if you involve the artist in that process will no doubt be inventive. And I'm sure that Rigo would have been able to help solve the problems that came up through the course of trying to figure out how to recontextualize this art piece. And I hope at some point uh, we, as a community, can insist that those developers will put this mural back the way that it was in originally intended. 
Thank you. If, yeah. I, if I could jump in, I mean, I, I totally agree with you, and I, I think uh, for sure an artist should not have their work exhibited in a manner that they, they didn't intend or don't want and should be consulted. But I definitely like um, this kind of emerging reality where the work of art isn't holy. You know, this notion that you're going to um, get a space and force everybody to accept your piece, you know, like, like that just doesn't have resonance for me. I, I just think I'm, I'm too democratic for that. And I think it is a peril for an artist to go into public art that you have to accept that, hey, it's not going to be there forever, and that's okay. And enjoy it and, you know, live with it for, for what you can. Um, I have, I have uh, made a lot of art objects myself. I love them, uh, but I don't cherish them to the point that, you know, if one of them uh, disappears or gets broken or all kinds of things have been burned and liquor's been spilled on them and <laughs> all kinds of things. And, and you just, you know, you have to have a good attitude about that stuff. And I get that the public sculpture is often bigger, more expensive, uh, it's definitely time intensive. But one of the reasons why we have so much you know, public art, as I was saying, I think is because of that emerging attitude. Actually, I think there's a really big trend towards um, temporary art in um, a lot of different cities. I know a lot of the places that I'm working, people are really interested in seeing temporary art, both because it's a way of testing the location, it's a way of, of artists being able to say things that are maybe more provocative and, and the and the response to the provocation is that it's not going to be there forever. And also it allows a lot of new ideas to come about. So I, th I definitely think that's something that, that people are more interested in these days. It, it shares the space. I mean, more yeah. artists are going to get to show there right. as well. Yeah. yeah. Cheryl? Well, I, I would agree, actually. And, and, and one of the things I find very interesting is um, that it, it also forces the conversation. It's only going to exactly. be there for a short time. And if you're interested in getting in, involved in the dialogue, it activates people and gets them to participate in a different way. Um, and uh, especially if you're dealing with contemporary social issues because those, oh, sh those issues are shifting and changing all the time. Right. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I'd like to open it up to the audience. Yes. Just at, just at the outset, I was just saying this idea of being willing to destroy work and you know putting all this energy into a, a gallery space. I mean, the point being, there's less neighborhood opposition when it's not going to be there forever. And so just this discussion that we're having. But it seems like Burning Man was just so much part of the story, and also I'm curious about the, another one, how the future of going forward. There are lots of cities devoted to art, like maybe San Francisco. Oh, I see. Okay. I just, I mean, right now, um, San Francisco has this incredible ecosystem of different entities doing art it's, it, uh, and funding art, uh, uh, corporate funding, private funding, neighborhood funding, nonprofit funding. I mean, more than I have ever seen in my life. Everybody and their Aunt Jane is doing public art. And so that we have, right now, if we don't lose our artists, um, probably just a, an incredibly vital um, uh, community uh, right now in terms of different types of public art. Patricia's, G, uh, Patricia's Green, um, which when uh, the original um, uh, art projects that were sponsored there um, was part of the whole remaking of Oct uh, Octavia. And uh, so the Arts Commission, I think we originally commissioned four different um, public art installations on, uh, in that area. And they became so popular that when our funding ran out, we could only do four of them, uh, the neighborhood association, a business association, started raising their own money. 
And so that just continued. And this is, that's something they run themselves. We're not involved. Uh, just recently, we started getting money from the Board of Supervisors uh, to uh, assist in uh, commissioning pieces for Patricia's Green. But really, it, it's a, it, it is a community-driven um, program. Right. I think we have time for one more question. Yes, over there. I'm really glad that you asked that question because it's a question that I was about to ask in a slightly different way. Um, about a month ago, um, Liz Ness and one of the other um, uh, Congress people questioned the fact that there is art at the VA hospital in Palo Alto and implied that having artists develop work for the VA was a waste of money because the money could have gone to helping the veterans uh, or that not that many people were going to see it. And I, I, I'm, I'm sure that other people on the panel have a perspective on this, but my perspective is that, well, first of all, there are legal reasons why the money couldn't be spent on other services, but I won't get into those. But my perspective on it is that, first of all, people that are in, there are a lot of different publics. The, the, the veterans are publics, people that visit um, the juvenile facility are, are part of the public and all of that. But the other thing is that great civilizations are actually judged by the culture and the art that they leave behind. And it doesn't always have to be in um, a place that everybody sees. When they were excavating the water, um, works in Istanbul, they found that underground in the waterworks there was a very significant piece of sculpture that was basically there for the people that worked there. And I think that, that it's really important to be able to have works that, that speak to a lot of different publics at different scales and in different locations because we're all part of this amorphous group that's called the public. But I'd like to hear what other people have to say about that. Well, I haven't thought about that. Um, you know, there are various different ways to interact with art. One is to physically be there and see it in person. And that can be very powerful and moving and um, help one reimagine um, their connection to that space. Another way to connect to that space and to that artwork is through hearing about it um, verbally told from one person to another. You imagine a tone of that piece. You might even be involved in the creative process of reinterpreting what that piece is. You may be able to see it in a photograph and you imagine what it is to interact with that piece. And if you yourself cannot ever access that piece, it creates a tension that can have a creative poetry to it. And so it's not as if that artwork doesn't exist and it's completely inaccessible. It's just that uh, you have alternate ways to experience it. Mm -hmm. That's good. Susan? Yeah, I, I actually feel that, um, you know, art is not just entertainment. And um, art often serves a real purpose. And I think I said earlier about my feeling that and many times art is really about um, effectively delivering a service. Um, for instance, one of our uh, recent clients is the city morgue. Now, there's no good reason, if you're at the city morgue, it's not for, there's no good outcome there. Um, so what, what does the city want to communicate to anybody who has to go through this horrible experience. 
Well, I think we want to communicate care and compassion, respect and dignity. And our art program there is designed to be part of that expression. No, you're not going to walk into some tacky, you know, waiting room with, you know, a grubby floor and, uh, you know, a uh, soulless feeling. We're going to have beautiful artwork. And maybe the people go, who go there might be so upset they might not even focus on the artwork, but it's there. And it's part of a beautiful environment that says, we care about you. We can't make this situation any better for you other than by how we treat you with our employees, the environment we ask, we provide to, for you. And um, so I, I, th th that's the role of the art there. It's, it's, it's not for entertaining. It's not, it's, it's, it's not for um, necessarily the general public, but it is very much about um, how the city is delivering a vital service. And I could say that for any project that, that we do. Yeah. Any other comments? I was just going to, I mean, I'm, it's an intriguing question because the idea of, you know, public money being spent on art that the public isn't going to have access to. Um, I'm, I'm probably less concerned about it knowing that there's so much being done in terms of public art. But, I mean, if you only had 10 projects and half of them were not accessible to the general public, that would bother me a lot. Um, yeah. And just quickly, um, I think because they're again going back to the site specific nature of some of these works, um, you really aren't given a choice in, in, in what I do. I mean, I, I can't put it on a street corner, a piece on a street corner unless it really speaks to the ecosystem of that location. So, you know, the job, the real job is interpreting it for people. Uh, making it easy for them to get there, sharing information on how to get there, um, but really the first responsibility is making sure that the ideas and the aesthetic of the artists are presented in a way that is in keeping with what they're trying to communicate. So should it be the city's responsibility or whoever is sponsoring the public art to find them some way to ensure access, public awareness? Susan, I know you've done dealt with this quite a bit because you really delved into the whole ADA issue and it connects to, to actually it connects to the question because it speaks to what is actually access and I know Cheryl you also are talking about the educational aspects of what you're doing with the foresight program so there are a lot of different ways that that art can be made accessible Susan you want yeah, to talk Yeah 99% of yeah. our work is is all publicly accessible um, ADA and otherwise, um, there's only a, a few you know, places where um, it, it, might, it might be restricted. But you know, of 1,700 pieces, most of that work is publicly accessible. And soon, it will be on the new city's uh, re, uh, revamped website so that you can actually um, uh, uh, see, the, uh, see the catalog and be able to know where the various sites are. And there's so many tools available now. I mean, one of the most exciting ones is the virtual reality. Exactly. I mean, we have 3D tours of our last two projects that you can check out online, and they're really fantastic. Yeah. So um, I think that we've run out of time. Thank you all. For